we accomplish. You see, in this time of confusion and chaos here in the world we live in, God has not gone into quarantine, and certainly the gospel has not gone into quarantine, and these are the days when we as a church should be most effective, the greater the darkness, the greater the light. So let's look to see what Jesus Christ wants us to accomplish. It's critical to God. Jesus, in the final days of his earthly ministry, emphasized for us what, in the sight of God, is truly important. What's important? So many things around us just aren't all that important, like NBA basketball in August. Talk about ridiculous and totally uninteresting. I caught just a glimpse of a, of a bit of a game that was being played the other day, and uh, they don't even have an audience. They just have these pictures of people watching at home uh, plastered uh, there in the background, and these guys are playing basketball in an empty stadium, and I'm just thinking, this is ridiculous. It's this is not important at all. Why do that? There are a lot of things that we do that just are not important at all. Some responsibilities are important, but they come in a category under something that is more important. Like your job is important. You have a responsibility to fulfill your task on your job. Or even things like mowing your grass at your house. Uh, that needs to be done. Feeding your family. Uh, we are called to take care of those under our responsibility. Uh, we have to. That we, it has to be done. But it's in light of Matthew 6, 33. Seek first, or as a way of priority, put this first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. A number of years ago, uh, John Piper preached a message that really did resonate in an amazing way with the college and the 20-something generation. I was just astounded how it, how it caught their attention. And what caught their attention really was the title of the message. And he titled his message, Don't Waste Your Life. Don't Waste Your Life. And that's a message we need to heed as well, even today. Don't waste your life with things that just aren't important. Identify what is really important to God, and then let's focus on that. Pay attention to what Jesus emphasized to his followers as he prepared them for their part in the kingdom as the church was established. So we're going to look at three texts, all part of a conversation that Jesus had on one evening in the upper room. John chapter 13 John chapter 15, and also John chapter 17. All of this happened less than 24 hours before Jesus was crucified. Now, think with me. If you knew today that you were going to die tomorrow, what would you be talking about? Let me ask you that again. If you knew today that you were going to die tomorrow, what would be important to you? What would you want to emphasize to those that you were going to influ influence that would go on beyond your lifetime? What would you want to talk about? So Christ in the upper room emphasized three major priorities. We need to take heed to this. These are things that we must wholeheartedly give ourselves to and our energies to accomplish. The first priority in John 13, and Jesus makes this point by example and admonition, is this. Be disciples of Christ who produce disciples who love like Christ. Not just live like Christ, but this is the emphasis here in John 13, that we love like Christ, and this is how it shows up. Look at the end of the chapter, John chapter 13, verse 35. Jesus said, by this... All people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He uses that word disciple. And they knew exactly what he meant by that disciple because for three and a half years they had been following him. And he, they were like the apprentice to the, the master craftsman. They were learning by his example. And that's what the idea of a disciple is. So when you're wanting to understand what is a disciple, you think of this word, example. 
You learn from the master. You follow his patterns. You imitate his life. You move right in and you learn to think and live exactly as he does. And they had done this for three and a half years. And that's what Jesus was demonstrating here in John chapter 13. By example, he showed his disciples what discipleship love really looked like. Look at verse 12. John chapter 13, verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right. You are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example. That's what a discipler does. He gives the example that is to be followed. That you also should do just as I have done. That's our responsibility. A few weeks later, Jesus came back to this emphasis. Uh, after his resurrection, but before his ascension, in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, you know these verses, and we call them the Great Commission. Jesus said, go, therefore, and make disciples. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. Actually do these things. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I love that. I am with you always. No matter what's happening, no matter what age it is, I am with you always. It's interesting in the original language here that Christ spoke. Uh, the, the only direct command here in verse 19 is make disciples. Uh, the instructions go and baptize and teach are indirect commands under that command of make disciples. They're participles in that language, so they're explaining how to make disciples. There's going, there's baptizing, and there's teaching or instructing. And, and these are the means by which fulfilling this command to make disciples, it, that's how it's accomplished. Evangelizing and instructing in the way. The Apostle Paul provides a great example of this. He was constantly on the go. We have these records of his, his missions endeavors, his trips that he made to go and find those looking for ways to share the good news of Jesus with the Gentile people. And along the way, he would identify and, and challenge individuals to commit their way to Christ, to follow Christ. And that's what they were doing when they were being baptized. They were a public testimony of their commitment to Jesus Christ. And he would instruct them. And we have much of, of, of this needful instruction in the letters or the epistles that God gave us in these uh, books that God provided through the Apostle Paul. So, in the margin of your Bible in John chapter 13, would you just jot these references, these cross-references, to understand how this discipleship looks, this example, this instruction. In Romans, you can see the enumeration and the explanation of the, of the doctrines of salvation. So right in there, the word Romans and salvation. Galatians, understanding grace. Galatians and grace. In Ephesians, comprehending the church. And in First and Second Timothy and Philemon and Titus, we have life touching life, uh, uh, where you're walking through life and giving instructions. Paul says, be an example of the believers in word and conversation and in doctrine. And, and commit yourself to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. You see, you want to live a life that pleases Jesus. It'll have to be invested in discipleship. So think about this. How is your life invested in discipleship? Spurring another on to want to follow Christ. Committing to follow Christ. And learning what that way looks like. You're going, you're committing, you're instructing. This is critical to God. And Jesus brought that out to us in John chapter 13. He set for us the example. Be disciples who love like Jesus loves. The second priority that Jesus brought out in this conversation that he had less than 24 hours before he went to the cross. Jesus emphasized this. Bear spiritual fruit that remains spiritual fruit 
that remains. It's lasting fruit, it remains, it's eternal, but then it's, it's spiritual fruit. It's not just physical, it's, it's something that involves the Holy Spirit. That's what we mean by spiritual. It's, so when you think of the word fruit, think of the word produce. So when you think of the word disciple, you're thinking of the word example. And when you're thinking of the word fruit, you're thinking of produce. Produce. Muscatine is famous in the summertime for their produce, their, their produce stands. Uh, my wife speaks of, of conversations that she would have with, with her grandparents back in the 60s who would every year make a trip in the summertime down here to Muscatine from Northwest Illinois on purpose to come here, to come to a, a fruit stand or a produce stand to, to find a muscatine melon or a watermelon. Just astounding how much there is produced. We don't have as many of these produce stands around nowadays, but they still are. And in fact, uh, back in July, on July 4th, we had an opportunity to stop at one of these. We had been down to Fruitland uh, to uh, be able to walk in the parade with, with Mark Lofgren and others uh, encouraging his campaign along. And after that, on the way back, uh, we were getting ready for our 4th of July cookout and picnic thing. And, and uh, so we, 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 we wanted to stop and, and get a, a watermelon. So we stopped at one of these, these produce stands and we you know, checked them out and, and decided to pick one. And when we brought that home, that was just an amazing watermelon. It was just, it was just fabulous. It was a muscatine watermelon. Amazing. But it didn't just happen to show up there at that fruit stand or that produce stand. Something happened long before that that produced that fruit. Somebody planted a seed and there was watering and there was sunshine and there, was, there were nutrients and it was all connected to the vine. That fruit came from a connection to a producer of that fruit. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Here, as we come into John chapter 15, I want to move back to, and, and establish again the context. We've been in John chapter 13. We saw how Jesus uh, washed the feet of the disciples and set the example of this discipleship. And in John chapter 14, Jesus launches into an incredibly important philosophy of life dis discussion. Look at verse 12 of John chapter 14. Jesus said, truly, truly, or you can count on it. I know what I'm talking about. This is the way it is. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And catch this. And greater works than these will he do because I am going to the Father. Now that produces question marks in my mind. How in the world can Jesus be saying that, that those that believe in him will do greater works than what he did? We'll keep on reading. In verse 16, we read that Jesus says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, a comforter, to be with you forever, forever. And this comforter, this helper, is the Spirit of Truth. The Spirit, capital S. The Holy Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for, catch this, he dwells with you and will be in you, will be in you. And that happened at Pentecost. He entered the church, every believer, and he dwells with you and will be in you. That word dwell is an important word because it's going to show up again in, in John chapter 15 many times. It's the word minnow, and it means to stay connected. It's translated abide, this word dwell is translated abide in John chapter 15, and it has the idea of being connected. That watermelon was connected to the vine that gave it its nourishment. So look at John chapter 15, verse 4. Abide, or stay connected, in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. 
the watermelon that we enjoyed was produced because it was connected to the vine. Abiding results in fruit. It produces fruit. Staying connected with the one who gives life is the one way to be able to be productive, to produce fruit. Now, fruit in Scripture isn't speaking of outward success. And we'll expand on this later because we want to come back to this. But, but it's speaking of a changed life. Fruit in your life shows up in what God changes. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All of these things combine together as one taste of this fruit. It, it's fruit of the lips that gives thanks. It's, it's fruit of giving. It's the fruit of righteousness. And it's the fruit of eternal lives, lives that have been brought to Christ through introduction to the gospel, people getting saved. That's the way we would say that. So in our one another uh, group this last Wednesday as we met, um, Jerry Willis uh, shared a story. It just came up as a, as a memory of his. He was, he was thinking of his first pastor, and he even remembered his name, John Goodwin. And this first pastor was having kind of a tough time in the church. The people were frustrated that the pastor wasn't getting enough people saved and into the church. And so they're on his case. Why aren't you getting more people saved and more people coming to church? And the pastor said to them very wisely, he said, I need to remind you that shepherds don't produce sheep. Sheep produce sheep. Ah, the productive part of a flock isn't the shepherd, it's the sheep. And so we could say the same thing here in this text, in this context. Uh, shepherds don't produce disciples. Disciples produce disciples, committing unto faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So John 15, verse 8, we read, By this my Father is glorified, or he's, he's magnified, we're able to see how awesome he is, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Abiding involves receiving from Christ a growing relationship. You're connected to him through the work of the Holy Spirit as we love and obey Christ's commands. And that relationship of love and obedience produces joy. Look at verse 11, John 15, verse 11. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy might be in you, and that your joy might be full, so much you can't even hold it all. Uh, my wife came home with some uh, peaches the other day from Hy-Vee, and they were, they were like about six inches around, and they were huge and so juicy, and we, you can almost make a meal out of one peach. There was just so much taste. It was, it was just so, so satisfying that your joy might be full. As we walk in the Spirit, as we draw near to the Lord in our relationship, as we abide in Christ, there's a fruitfulness that produces joy. This is critical. It's essential. So we have to be asking ourselves in our, in our ministry together as a church, what are we doing to enable this abiding fruit? What ways can this pulpit ministry influence that? How can our Sunday school classes and our small groups, our one another care and prayer groups, avail of this fruitfulness? And what are your friendships, your one-to-one -one contact with others? What are your friendships doing to help spur you on in this abiding relationship in your love for Jesus Christ and your joy in Him? So this involves routines of Bible reading and scripture memory and prayer and 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 fellowship, interacting with each other as we worship the Lord. And your interaction and your heart response to the Spirit, making much of the Word, Jesus Christ, really is what this is all about. Living out your life choices that enhance your relationship with Jesus Christ. Paul, in his epistles, addressed this. Again, uh, in, in John chapter 15 in your Bible, if you'll just write in the margin these cross-references. Uh, think about these books of the Bible as, as you think of John chapter 15. In the book of Romans, there's the indwelling spirit 
enumerated in, in Romans chapter 15. In Galatians, we're led by the Spirit, and, and we understand the fruit of the Spirit, as we addressed earlier. In Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, we read this, In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God, and it's by the Spirit. And 14 times in this short book of Ephesians, uh, we read of the work of the Holy Spirit and what it is to be filled with the Spirit, not being drunk with wine, but being filled with the Spirit. This is essential. And then there's a third priority. <clears throat> we gather in unity. We make disciples. We bear spiritual fruit. And Jesus wanted to emphasize that we would continue to be one that we would gather in unity. When you think of the word unity, you think of the word together. We're together. Different ones that are together. We're, we're unified. So think of the word example as you think of the word disciple. Think of the word produce as you think of the idea of fruitfulness. And think of the word together as you think of the word unity. And we are together in unity. In John chapter 17, so we've looked at John chapter 13, all part of the same evening, Jesus was serving them and loving them and showing them discipleship. In John chapter 15, he was bringing out the urgency that we abide so that we can be fruitful. In John chapter 17 is Jesus' prayer. It's really the Lord's prayer. It's an extended prayer. It's the longest prayer that we have of, of how Jesus spoke. We know that he prayed all night. and We don't have the words for that. But here we have one prayer that was spoken in this upper room with his disciples. Jesus prayed in this prayer that we'd be together, that we'd be unified. And when you think of the word unity, again, think of the word together or think of the word one. In John 17, Christ's way of saying unity, <clears throat> it jumps out to us in the word that he used a number of times, and it's the word one. Look for that. Here in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying for you. He's praying for you knowing that you will face trials, devastating trials, things that you just don't know what the solutions will be. He's praying for you. And we will face trial. And we're to count it all joy when we fall into these different kinds of trials. But look at verse 13. So as Jesus is praying for you knowing that you will face trials, in John chapter 17, verse 13, Jesus said this, But now I am coming to you, the Father, and these things I speak here in the world, that they, speaking of us, may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. How is that going to happen? How are we going to experience this joy fulfilled in us as a church? Well, look at verse 20, John chapter 17, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me. That's us. So I have in my margin, that's me. Those that will believe later as, as these disciples do their job. And eventually, after centuries, that's including us in this prayer. That they all may be one. Those who will believe in me through their word, the disciples that they may be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us. So that, here's what happens, the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, even as we are one. That word one is describing the unity that God provides that gives us great joy together. Look at verse 23. Again, it comes back to this. I in them and you in me that they may become perfectly one. John chapter 17, verse 23. That they may be perfectly, completely made one. So that, here again, so that the world may know that you have sent me and love me even as you have loved me. And, and love them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, Jesus continues on to pray, 
whom you have given me may be with me where I am. To see my glory that you have given me because you have loved me before the foundation of the world. Here again, this is this promise of eternal life that Jesus here prays for us and knows will be a reality. The testimony of a church, a church family, working together, worshiping together, serving together, can be such a dynamic testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can count on it that the devil doesn't like that, and he won't put up with that, and he will fight against that. So here in your Bible in John chapter 17, if you'll put in your margin to think about this reference, Ephesians chapter 6, also Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 6, there's a spiritual warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the workers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The devil wants to defeat this unity, this joy that the church is supposed to exude. I just received a text on Saturday, Saturday morning, from a dear friend who's a young pastor who just had to resign from his church because of the division that had been developing over a number of months and the, and the angst and the anger that came out between believers who just were not walking in unity. It's devastating. Know this, that the devil and his emissaries will do all they can to destroy the unity that a church is to be ex ex as showing as an example of the glory of the gospel. But right in here, as well as a cross-reference in your Bible, Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6, Paul says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience. There's, there's a message in each one of those words. And bearing with one another, there's a message there as well, and that's one of the one another's we've studied this summer. And eager to maintain, catch this, the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And Jesus goes on to say, There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Speaking of this unity, time after time. Look down at verse 11. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And here's this work. For building up the body until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Here's this matter of unity. Working together, this unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Let's skip on down to verse 15. The whole body joined and held together. So the question is, what are we doing to build up that unity? What are we doing to maintain and, and establish this unity? This is urgent, that we pray together. That we pray together for the unity of the Spirit. And we commit to this humble, this, um, this gentle, this patient, this bearing with one another, that we would maintain or establish the unity of the Spirit that the, the Spirit of God intends for us to know. And this is part of our testimony. It's a major part of our testimony. This is key. Let me encourage you as, as, as families to pray together. The devil doesn't want families to maintain unity. He wants to divide husbands and wives and children from their parents. But the family that prays together stays together. Would you commit to taking time to pray together? I'd encourage you to take walks or, or drive together in the same car. And during that time, you just start talking to Jesus together. Pray together. And we as a family of, of, of a church body, we need to commit to being able to pray together. And we're going to be talking about more of that as we go forward in this year, this fall, and this later in January. 
serving together, working together, fellowshipping together, which we've discovered in some whole new ways of what it means to share the word together in our one another, our, our care and prayer groups this summer, uh, speaking of what Christ is speaking to us together from the word, and certainly worshiping, singing, uh, drawing together under the ministry of the word, um, and understanding that doctrine is the basis for our unity. Doctrine doesn't divide. Doctrine unifies when we understand the truth of God's word. Ultimately, we want to please Jesus. Amen? We make it our aim to please him. And it's our responsibility to help you, as a body of believers, help you. We are equipping you to please Jesus through your ministry of discipleship, your relationship of fruitfulness, and your participation in unity of the body. In the days ahead, Lord willing, you're going to be hearing more and more about each of these critical to God issues, these priorities, as we endeavor to work together at Walnut Park Baptist Church. Clearly, God has given us four, uh, four core values, and you've heard this the first year, five years or so ago, uh, you heard these, these factors mentioned again and again for over a year, our core values, the Bible is truth. We can count on it. And, and life is all about Christ, our Lord and our God. And, and our response to the gospel changes everything. Our whole view of life and what we do, our response to the gospel changes everything. And God's love motivates us. God's love motivates us. These are our core values. And out of that, we've been able to zone in on our mission statement, which is to, because of all of this, these core values, we're going to follow Christ and help others follow Christ. We have it on our church sign. We're following Christ. That's our mission. Now we need to think about how. What is critically important for us to be able to fulfill that mission? Let me share with you a, a story and, and how it relates to what we've just talked about. Um, Several years ago, God introduced us to uh, a ministry called Leadership Journey. And our deacons reviewed it, and, and we together sense this is a, a prompting of God for us to, to really do what's important to God. And so we, we started two years ago uh, a, a group of men gathering in this leadership journey. And that, that gathering that went on for most of the year, 24 weeks, uh, uh, started with a retreat and during that retreat we gathered in an, in an exercise to uh, it was called a value stream exercise many of you that are in business understand the, the importance of value streaming but where you start with uh, raw product and you you come up with with something that is is really good and satisfying to your customer and obviously we are wanting to please Jesus please God and so what is critically important to God? And so that first year, I think we had 20, maybe 25 different things that we saw that were really important to God. And, uh, you know, a, a variety of things. The second year, as the new guys were involved in the same exercise, uh, they had it narrowed down, many of those same things, but narrowed down to, uh, I think it was like eight or nine various things that would help us glorify God or do what was really important to God. And then a few weeks ago, we put those two groups together, the, the guys that did it the first year and their list and the guys that worked on this the second year and their list, and we just sat down and were searching through it all, and it really zoned into these things that were critically important to God. Discipleship, spiritual fruit, and unity, that we would be together. And it was like we all came together thinking, yes, that's it. And we were just working through all the things that, that we sensed the Spirit of God emphasizing to us. Well, during that meeting, I was thinking, you know, I think I've heard this somewhere before. Where did I, where did I get that? Where have I heard that? And then in the days to follow, God prompted me to think of the final conversation Jesus had with his disciples where he enumerated what was really important, what was essential, what were his priorities, what was critical to God. 
And Jesus emphasized what we are to be emphasizing. And it was a confirmation to me that we must be about making disciples, bearing spiritual fruit by abiding in our relationship with Christ and gathering together in unity. So we want to flesh these out as we go forward in ministry together this fall. Uh, again, as I said, we're not in a quarantine for serving Christ. Uh, these circumstances should be an opportunity for us to further the cause of Christ, not just sit back and say, oh, I can't do anything now. And it's our tasking for us to be able to identify what it is that God wants us to do in these days to be able to be most productive for his kingdom's sake. Christ gave us the direction and the example and, and the admonition. Empowering discipleship, enabling fruitfulness, and equipping unity. Lord God, you've spoken to us through your word. You've given us Jesus Christ to show us the way. And you've provided salvation in him alone. I thank you that the gospel of Jesus Christ is complete in him. And we can draw near to you out of faith, out of, out of response to your word and, and obeying you. We can draw near every believer in Jesus Christ can bear fruit and enjoy the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And may that be part of our testimony as a body of believers. Oh God, I ask that you would use us and strengthen us in this cause and direct us in the days ahead that we would be making disciples, bearing much fruit and enjoying the unity of the spirit as a body of believers. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.